Thank you, United Church. True. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Um, Kenneth, at some point, I don't really care when, but at some point, if you could have someone bring me some tissues, because, man, I was not anticipating um, getting that emotional up here on the front row, but I need to tell you just to, before I jump in a little bit of the reason why I'm emotional. Um, the first time that I, I came to be a part of uh, ministry that your pastor was doing um, was a little tiny youth group of probably about 50 people, maybe if that. Um, some of you guys were in that youth group. Thank you. We're family, right? This is okay. Well, we're family now. Here we go. <clears throat> and uh, I came up for a winter weekend retreat, 2000, I think maybe January, February 2009, something like that. And uh, Ryan Picone, first time he'd ever touched a light board. Um, I was like, what is that skinny little boy going to do with lights, you know? And uh, wow, you know? Um, and uh, several of you guys were a part of that. But, but, but I, wanna, man, I just want to say what you guys have going on here. Please do not think that this is normal. Please do not ever get used to the Holy Spirit of God moving in the powerful way that he's moving here. And please also don't think that it happened overnight. There has been blood, sweat, and tears. There have been prayers. There have been people on their knees for years and years and years. And they've sown seed that you're reaping a harvest in, in your own life right now. And I got to see some of that seed. At the very yeah, I think we need to give... People who went before us, honor, and, um, and you have the opportunity to go before others. I believe that what God is doing here at United Church and what we're seeing right now today, this weekend, is just the tip of the iceberg of what God wants to do. And you, the people in this room, the people in the next experience, you have the opportunity to lay the foundation of something that's going to shake the foundations of the kingdom of darkness, that's going to shake the foundations of the kingdom of light, that's going to lead a revival across this nation and across this world, unlike history has ever seen. And it can start right here with you. And um, I need you to know how special your pastor is to me. He is my very best friend. And we have walked through so many ups and downs together. And I feel so honored to stand on this stage. Um, I, I sat down there and was like, I can't believe he lets me come up here and preach on this stage. Um, but I just feel overwhelmed with God's presence here, with, with, with your presence here. And I, I just appreciate you letting me be here. Um, Kenneth and I spent a lot of time together in college. You can't, you can't believe a word that he says about me in college. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, because I'm telling you, we shared a lot of really great things, and, and, um, but, but I, I want to talk to you today because I don't have a whole lot of time. I want to talk to you today about um, hurting with hope, hurting with hope. Um, one of those experiences uh, that Kenneth was there for me was uh, when I walked through and have been walking through the greatest tragedy of my life. And I need you to know something about life. Um, I don't want you to have any wool pulled over your eyes, and I don't want you to have any misconceptions about life, uh, there is going to be trial and tragedy in life. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be sorrow. What I love about this person, Jesus, that we follow is that he doesn't try to pull the wool over our eyes. He actually told us, hey, in this world you will find trouble. There will be sorrow. But he said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the thing that overwhelms you, you can know it does not have to overcome you because Jesus' power living inside of us overcomes any circumstances that comes around us. And there was a circumstance that came around me a couple years ago that I never thought I would live through. And um, Kenneth Wagner was on ground zero for that. Um, Tuesday morning, November 10th, I was coming back from the gym, I was finishing up some some reps at the gym talking to my friend Kenneth, and I stayed on the phone for a little bit outside in my uh, driveway, finished up the phone call, and walked in to my house to my absolute worst nightmare. Uh, my wife at the time seven, of seven years, Amanda Grace, was lying on our living room floor, face down in a pool of blood. And in that moment, I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that in life, in that moment, my world completely shattered and turned upside down. And I've been on a journey ever since then to try to find hope and healing in the midst of hurt. And I want to stand here today, if you don't hear anything else that I say, I believe that there's going to be some very applicable things for you today. If you don't hear anything else, I need you to understand that in the midst of tragedy, because of our God, we can stand in triumph. 
And I know that some people in here, you, um, you're walking through a level or a measure of pain, and you might look at me and you might say, Davey, it doesn't compare at all to the pain that you have walked through watching your, your wife's life slip away right there on the living room floor and then 24 hours later pass away in the hospital. But I need you to know that you cannot compare pain. I need you to know in here that comparing pain is futile because it's a lot like comparing a bite to a bee sting. You can't compare it. Pain is pain. So it does not matter what measure of pain you're walking through. I need you to know that the problem of pain is the fact that we live in a fallen world and the solution to that is a Savior who wants to come and restore and redeem your story, not for your glory but for His, no matter what you're going through. So I want to I want to just share with you a little bit my story. And I want to share with you a little bit about what I've been learning in the process of this story. Um, I met my wife in college. Uh, and I'm not talking about Kenneth, uh, you know, <laughs> the other love of my life, you know. <laughs> I uh, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, Roll Tide. Uh, graduated from Tuscaloosa County High School, went on to go and play at, at Southern Wesleyan University, play baseball, baseball scholarship there. And, um, God called me into ministry. I don't know if you've ever had one of those callings on your life where you, you, you feel like God's put something deep inside of you to go and do something great for his kingdom. And so I followed this call, um, went to Southern Wesleyan, met Kenneth. And somewhere in the, our sophomore year, I remember talking to another buddy of ours named Gavin. And we used to talk about and joke around about how we needed to go over to Clemson University, which was five minutes down the road because all the babes were over at Clemson University. And we needed to meet girls who were best friends so we could just hang out all the time. And, uh, and, and so about sophomore year, Gavin comes home from freshman summer and he goes, hey, Davey, I need you to, um, I, 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 I feel like I've, I've met somebody or I, I know somebody that you need to meet. And it's my girlfriend's sister. And I'm like, Okay, and he starts telling me about her and says that she's a, a senior in high school and the time I was a sophomore in college and that to me, the disparity just seemed like too much to, to bridge. And I was like, there's no way the guys on the baseball team will let me live this down dating a high schooler. There's no way we're not going to do it. He goes, dude, just meet her. So I went up over fall break with him to meet her and we went to a Hawk Nelson concert. Come on, back when Hawk Nelson was really good. <laughs> was not just playing on Kayla back when they were underground, you know. And uh, we went to a Hawk Nelson concert, went afterwards to Steak and Shake. You guys have Steak and Shake here? Oh, man, the Holy Spirit of God has not descended on Dover, Delaware yet <laughs> with Steak and Shake. Come on. We went to Steak and Shake afterwards, and I was trying to be all flirtatious with her. And I, I look across, and we're drinking milkshake. She's probably drinking strawberry. I'm drinking chocolate because saved people drink chocolate. Sinners drink strawberry. And so I looked across the table at her and I said hey milkshake drinking contest ready go and we start slurping our milkshake and she's sucking it down then I crack a joke trying to be really cute and funny trying to be flirtatious and she laughs and shoots milkshake out of her nose and I looked at her and I said I'm gonna marry that girl <laughs> and we did we dated long distance for a couple years while she was in college in Florida I was in college in South Carolina we we did the dating thing and then after we both graduated she with a two-year degree me with a four-year degree we ended up getting married and we settled in in South Carolina, started this, ministry, started this ministry, a part of a church that was growing, fast growing just like this. We were the first ones to start a campus. Come on, you guys are starting a campus here pretty soon. Isn't that awesome that you're going to be able to reach people in communities who maybe won't drive here? It's really cool. So I was a part of starting the first campus at this church, and it was just this incredible experience. People were meeting Jesus left and right. People standing in every experience. They were meeting Jesus. It was an incredible, incredible um, start to ministry. We were cutting our teeth. We thought we would be there for the rest of our lives. And then God began to stir something deep on our hearts to go and plant a church in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I said, what the heck are we going to do in Indianapolis, Indiana? Why would we leave the beautiful, sunny South Carolina for Indianapolis, Indiana? What is that, a fo frozen tundra? I didn't know anything about that other than that was the birthplace, and that was um, my wife at the time, her home place. And so I don't know if you felt this stirring, like a calling of uh, to go and do something really challenging and also re really um, fulfilling, but it was something we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't go to sleep at night, at night without thinking about it. We couldn't wake up without thinking about it. And for eight months, we prayed against it, and we thought we'd be at New Spring Church for all of our lives, and God said, no, I have this other plan for you. I want you to go. And so finally, we started praying open-handedly. I need you to know that when you start praying open-handedly, you will be in the midst of the greatest movement of God that you could ever imagine in your life, but it does not mean it will be easy. 
So we started praying open-handedly, and God said, God paved the way for us to open all these doors for us to move to Indianapolis, Indiana. We finally got on the ground November of 2011 in Indianapolis, and we started looking for houses. We knew we needed to make a statement that we were there and we were planted. And so we started looking around at houses. The very first house that we look at to buy, Amanda walks up to me, and she goes, this is our house. Now I'm like, okay, let's be reasonable. I'm trying to be all, you know, like I'm investor savvy. You know, you make the money at the purchase. I don't want to just, you know, let's look around. We don't know where the good schools are. We don't know where safe places are. We don't know where, where we're going to start our church. We don't know anything about the city. She goes, this is our house. And I was like, well, let's just take a look. I'm not sure about this. And she gave me that look. Come on, husbands, you know that look. <laughs> that like, you know I'm right kind of look. She gave me that look, and I was like, okay, well, let's just do it. So we looked around at 25 other houses. We came back to that house, and she said, this is our house. I told you this is our house. I was like, okay, but it's above our price range. And so we went to our realtor, and we made this really low-ball offer. And the lady on the other end of the table, the realtor who represented the, the sellers, she laughed at us, said, we're not even going to entertain that offer. You better come back with a much higher offer. We've turned down three offers much higher than that. So we went home, we prayed about it because we didn't want to manipulate the situation. Amanda's grandmother always said that faith is living without scheming. And so we went home and prayed about it and felt like God put this number on our heart that we were supposed to stay at that number. And so we went back to our realtor and we said, hey, put in the same exact offer. Realtor looked at us like, okay, now you're smoking something. Like, I know you're crazy. We put in the same offer and miraculously she accepted. And this little house on Sunnyfield Court became our home. And that home became really special because that's the home that we started our church in. Started with four people in a living room. I think one person was pregnant, so we counted it as five. Hello, you know, church growth. <laughs> I think at some point we Skyped a couple people in. We were like, we have multi-site church. Hello, you know. This was, uh, this was where we started our church. We actually started our kids' ministry in our master bedroom. We put veggie tails on. I can't tell you how many nights we crawled into our sheets and goldfish was in our sheets, you know. We're like... Well, you know, don't despise humble beginnings. Hello. In fact, that living room that, um, of that house is where the very first people that received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in our church received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It was a very special house. It's where we brought Weston, our, uh, our son, home after we had him at the hospital. I didn't have him as much as Amanda had him. It's a little more her role than mine. It's where we brought Weston home. It was a very special house. But it's also the same house that on that fateful morning I walked in and found my wife struggling for her life. And I thought there was something horrifically wrong with um, just the pregnancy. We, we were 13 weeks along with our second. We were going to name her Evie Grace. And I thought if we could just get Amanda to the hospital, everything's going to be okay. And so I called 911. It felt like an eternity while I was sitting there waiting for the paramedics. And we get her to the hospital and... While I'm in a waiting room waiting to see her, some investigators and some doctors come in and they inform me the news. That there were three bullet holes in her. One through her arm, one through her back, and one through the back of her head. And the prognosis didn't look good. They were going to wait for swelling to go down to see if they could operate. They were keeping her alive with ventilators and tubes. So for 24 hours we prayed that God would do a miracle. And I believed it. I believed God was going to do a miracle. And I remember praying this bold prayer of faith that a revival was going to sweep across the hospital because people who didn't know Jesus were going to see a miraculous healing right there and they were going to put their faith in Jesus. And now on the other side of things, I see that God did want to sweep a revival, but not just across a hospital, across a nation. And that people were going to put their trust in Jesus because of a different type of healing. Because oftentimes, um, the miracle that you're asking for is not the miracle that you need. Oftentimes, the miracle that you need is actually a miracle that comes out of brokenness for the benefit of other people. In those 24 hours, God began doing something really crazy in my heart. And that's what I want to share with you about. Because when we discovered that she was legally deceased, that there was no brain activity, my world turned upside down. You been there? You ever been there? You got the news? You got the phone call? You had the bad doctor's report? You been there? I didn't know what to do. My dad's a pastor, and I grew up in church. I joke around that, <laughs> that I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. <laughs> but you know what? I'm so glad today that, that I was drugged to church. 
I'm so glad that every time the doors were open, my parents had me there because I would hear over and over and over the truths of God's word that in any storm, he can be our anchor. And I had no idea what to do in that moment, but all of those seeds that had been sown into me, when life hit my life, right? You know, when tragedy strikes your life, when life hits life and it squeezes things out of you, what comes out of you is what was already in you. And I'm so grateful my parents had me around Jesus people all my life so that what came out of me was Jesus. Come on, parents, some of you need to hear that today. Bring your kids to church weekly. Bring them here all the time because you're establishing a foundation for them that's going to help them as they walk through the tragedies of their life. They need an anchor known as Jesus. I had no idea where to turn except for Jesus because my parents sowed that into me. So I started reading the Psalms. I don't know why. I just chose it. I was like Psalms. Now, to me, before any of this happened, I didn't understand the Psalms. It looked like to me that it was some crazy guy who wrote it, right? I mean, think about it. King David wrote most of the, most of the Psalms. Like one chapter would be like, God, I feel you so near to me. Your breath is on my neck. And then the very next chapter, he's like, where are you? You've abandoned me. You know, it's like, dude, this guy is schizophrenic. Get him some medication right now. (laughs) I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it until I walked through my tragedy. I didn't understand it until I faced the reality of now having to be a single dad. My wife having been murdered by three guys who broke into my house. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what it meant to have those highs and lows of emotion. I didn't understand until I walked through this tragedy. And then I began to understand what it meant to wake up every single day. And on one day, you have this peace that passes all understanding. You know the truth that God is near to those who are brokenhearted. I I understood what it meant to stand in front of national television and declare the goodness of the Lord in in the land of the living, even though I had only seen death. But I also understood what it meant the next day to wake up and to feel like all I wanted to do was take my life. Because I was so overcome with depression and anxiety and confusion as to how I was going to go on without my wife. I didn't get it. I just kept diving into the Psalms. I kept trying to figure out, God, this is not how I would have written my story. I had a beautiful family. I got a picture right here of of my family. This was Easter of 2015, a few months before Amanda passed. And as I was diving through the Psalms and reading, and I was like, this is not, I don't get it. I started figuring out in Scripture that oftentimes the, the people that God calls to do something great, first he has to wound deeply. And they're going to walk through some kind of tragedy so that he can prove his triumph over all of sin and over all of pain. As I kept diving into the Psalms, there's one Psalm that stuck out to me, and you're going to know it very well if you have been in any affiliation with church. It's Psalm 23, right? Everyone's got maybe a coffee mug, or your grandmother's got like the feathered hair hippie Jesus up on her wall with the lamb, you know, and the flowing hair, and Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And I was reading through Psalm 23, but one verse stuck out to me, and it was verse 4 of Psalm 23. And this is what it says right here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And it stuck out to me, and the Lord brought me to that because I kind of understood a little bit of what that meant. And you don't understand what it means to feel near to the Lord until you walk through some kind of really difficult tragedy you don't fully grasp it and then if you have a kid (laughs) you can really understand it right like my little boy he hates the dark but something about my presence with him in the dark gives him the strength to walk through the dark I'll never forget the first time I tried to prompt him to walk into a dark room and he just looks at me and he looks at the lights he looks at me looks at the lights he didn't know how to communicate and he was like daddy eyes daddy eyes daddy eyes and I finally figured out because you know I have those mommy skills hello the translation mommy skills you know what I'm talking about, moms? You hear your kid go, it's like, oh, yeah, he wants a cup of water and some goldfish. <laughs> That's not what he said, right? <laughs> but I, I started translating, and he goes, daddy, eyes, daddy, eyes. And I realized he meant, oh, it's dark in there. I can't go in there. I'm like, hey, buddy, there's lots of toys in there. There's so much blessing in there. Just walk in there, have the courage and strength. And the first time that he looked up at me, he goes, daddy, go with me. It dawned on me. Oh, my gosh. My son is willing to go into any kind of darkness as long as he knows his dad is with him. Psalm 23, verse 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they come for me. So I, so I like was reading that one morning, and I, I went back. I'm like, hold on. And God just kind of spoke to my heart. Hey, Davey, I want to speak something really powerful into your life through this verse and through this passage. He said, start over. I was like, okay. So, so let's read it. Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, I, I love this verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Man, I can dig that. Like, the fact that I have some other guide, some other boss, when I yield my life to Jesus, when I turn the keys over to him and he becomes my boss, then I lack for nothing. That he's going to fulfill me and fill this God-sized void in my heart, unlike any prescription medication can, unlike any alcohol, unlike any kind of drug, unlike any kind of relationship or career, unlike anything in my life, the shepherd is going to make sure that I have no want. I love that. Verse 1, I'm like, come on. I'll hang my hat, I'll stake my life on that verse. That's a good verse. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. A couple months ago, um, my family and I, we went to this beach house on, like, down in Destin, Florida, like, on the beach. It was an incredible experience. It was, like, given to us. And some of you were like, man, must be nice, especially this cold weather. Hey, it was. Hello. (laughs) But it reminds me that it's like, These times when life seems up and to the right, these times when everything seems peaceful, these times when everything seems to be going well, these times where you you are laying down in green pastures, where it's like this is beautiful and serene and I love this. Like I can dig these. I wish the Bible was full of verses like this, don't you? I can even dig verse 3. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He's going to refresh me. We walk into settings like this. You go into your small groups or he'll refresh you or restore your soul so you can walk out Monday through Saturday and you can be the church out there. I love that. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, meaning that when I do give him over the keys to my life, he begins to change me from the inside out, that I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. He changes my attention, my affections, everything about my heart. From the inside out, I'm becoming a new person. That's awesome. Praise God for verse 1 through 3. And then verse 4 happens. You had a verse 4 hit your life? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The first time I read this, I used to think that the valley of the shadow of death was punishment for something I had done wrong. Come on. Sometimes we believe this, right? Well, something bad happened to my life, so this must be God punishing me. And I saw this, and the, and the Lord goes, no, 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 I want you, Davey, go back to verse 3, because it's not punishment for something you've done wrong. I want to actually show you something that is a little bit a different perspective. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Then verse 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, go, hold on, go back, go back. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Verse 4. He leads me in paths of righteousness, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. He leads me... So so wait, the valley of the shadow of death isn't this like journey that we get on and all of a sudden because we did something wrong or because we took a misstep or because we made a mistake, then all of a sudden God's not not there and he's, he's up in heaven going, man, I sure hope you can get yourself out of the valley of the shadow of death. It sucks for you. Figure your way out. Like th- that's not what this is. Hold on a second. Like it, 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 that's what I thought it was, that it was punishment for something. But this tells me, he leads me in paths of righteousness, for, though I walk through, he leads me in paths of righteousness Though I, walk, I wonder if one of the paths of righteousness that God leads us into is the valley of the shadow of death. Don't lose me on this. I wonder if there are certain things about our growth and our relationship with Jesus that can't otherwise happen unless we are led into the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder if there is part of our sanctification that can't happen unless we walk through a little bit of struggle. Come on, we all know this intuitively because we all know the phrase no pain, no what? Some of our philosophy in life is no pain, no pain, hello. (laughs) But we all know that there are certain muscles physically that cannot be grown or cannot be enhanced unless it's put under some kind of duress. No pain, no gain. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death is the pain that leads to gain. And the Lord showed me that, and I'm like, okay, well, what kind of gain? Because this doesn't feel like gain. Hold on a second. What kind of gain is going on here? He said, well, let me give you three gains that are happening, 
inside of your life when you walk through struggle. And these are three things that God's put inside of my life. The first one is this. He's making you dangerous. He's making you dangerous. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, keep reading, Davey. I'll show you. I'll show you what I'm doing right here. Because not only am I going to lead you into the valley of the shadow of death, but if I, if I see you to it, I'm going to see you through it. Come on, I said if I see you to it, I'm going to see you through it. That he is not a God that leads us into something that he is not going to finish. He began a good work in you, he's going to finish it. He's making you dangerous. Let's, let's read verse 5. It says this. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Prepare a table before me in the presence. How dangerous of a dude do you have to be to dine in the presence of your enemies? Come on, you ever seen the movie like 300 or Lord of the Rings or these war movies? And I just imagine like you're on a battlefield and like you've got this, this, this army surrounding you and yet you're not afraid because the army that surrounds the army that surrounds you is greater than the army that surrounds you. Come on. Like, this army's surrounding you, and I don't care how Gerard Butler-esque you are, this is Sparta, right? <laughs> the army that surrounds you is an intimidating army, but because there is something greater that lives in you than he that is in the world, you sit and dine in the presence of your enemies. You're like, okay, before I open up a can of, on you, I'm going to open up a can of Chef Boyardee right here. Hello. <laughs> this is dangerous. Like, like, it reminds me of this guy named Apostle Paul who said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's dangerous. What do you do with a guy who is not afraid to die? Well, they tried to do something to him to silence this whole movement of Christianity that he was leading. They were like, okay, let's do this. All right, here we go, here we go. We're going to put him in prison. And he was like, okay, I'll start a prison ministry from the inside. And all the jailers got saved. And the people in prison. They were like, don't, that didn't work. All right, so we're going to take him out. We're going to flog him, make a, a, make a representation of him. And then all the people saw the triumph that he walked through that flogging in. And they were like, I want what he has. And he shared the gospel and all these people got saved. Don't, that didn't work either. Let's kill him. Okay, you make him a martyr and more people get saved. That's a dangerous dude. What do you do to a guy who is that dangerous? You can't do anything to him. You know why? Because he doesn't value his life anymore. Because there's been so much of his life that's been stripped away from him that was about him that now he can walk in triumph and make his life about something greater than him. That's dangerous. You, you see, a powerful symbol for me through this whole thing, and there was a powerful symbol for Amanda in our dating relationship, was the symbol of a sword. I just love, I'm a freak about the movie Braveheart. Come on, you guys know, freedom. I love Braveheart, right? So when we were engaged for Valentine's that year, I sent her a sword. <laughs> she, she's, she's away in college, and she gets all of her roommates around her and says this oblong box, right? And they're like, wow, this must be the biggest flower bouquet I've ever seen. She pulls out this sword. Can you imagine? But, but in that box was also an epic poem called The Fight, where I wrote to her, I said, hey, um, I promise to fight for your heart for the rest of my life. <laughs> Chocolates, flowers, sword, hello. <laughs> but then I said this, I said, I'm asking you to join me in the greatest fight of all time, and that's the fight for people's hearts who are far from God. And then we did a first look when we got married where that means the auditorium was empty and she walked down for me for the very first time and she had, behind her back, she had a sword. And she presented it to me when she got to me and she said, today I'm joining you in that fight. The sword became a very powerful symbol. Now there's a single dude in here who's like, Braveheart sword, okay. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but let me tell you what's powerful about a sword. What's powerful about a sword is the way it's forged. Because I don't know if you've ever seen this new TV show about how they forge these swords, but it's forged under intense heat and intense pressure. They put it into, into a fire that is upwards of 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and the blacksmith or the swordsmith will put the sword in the fire, and then he'll pull it out, put it on an anvil, and then he'll, bam, he'll beat it until it's durable enough to withstand battle. It's got to be durable because it can't go into battle being brittle. And so there's a preparation process that has to happen, but that preparation process is full of, if I were to personify feelings onto the sword, pain. 
I can't imagine the sword's like, ooh, that feels good, a little left to the right. You know, like, I can't imagine. It's, it's a painful experience for this sword. And whether the pain comes to you through means of wickedness or whether it's God's discipline inside of you, we don't get to determine. But every time pain comes to you, you and I have an opportunity on how we're going to react and the perspective in which we see it. Do we see it as something that's breaking us down? Bam! Or do we see it as something that's building us up? Because I can promise you the enemy will try to bring some pain into your life as well. And that pain will be to try to deter you, to distract you, to disappoint you. But what the enemy means means for evil God always means for good and you can look at the enemy and say the pain that you're meaning to bring in to distract me and deter me deter me God is making me dangerous come on he's making us dangerous and with every blow of the hammer you can be reminded God is chiseling me into a warrior he is wielding me into a weapon to be dangerous against the kingdom of darkness and for the kingdom of light see I don't care about my life anymore if God takes me after I step off this stage, I'm like, okay, I want to go home. It's fine. Makes me dangerous. Because now I can say anything I want to up here to point people to Jesus and not fear the worst because I've walked through the worst. Makes you dangerous. The, the next thing is um, he increases your capacity. He's increasing your capacity. He's increasing your capacity. You see, we all have a capacity. We all have a calling on our life. And in fact, this verse kind of speaks to it, the next part of it. It says, um, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Have you ever seen in a process of anointing? I don't know if you guys do baby dedications here, if you've ever seen somebody anointed with oil. But basically what they're doing in that moment, you see it in Scripture where prophets will anoint kings. In fact, King David got anointed by the prophet Samuel. What you see happen is that they'll put oil over top of their head, or they'll put it on their forehead, they'll pour it over the top of their head. And that oil is a type of oil, it's called olive oil. And it's a very special symbol of saying there is a special calling or a mantle on your life. Now, that took place in specific instances back in Scripture, but what the New Testament tells us is that every single one of us have been anointed with a calling, that every one of us have a unique and distinct calling that's been placed on our life that God wants to, to, to untap as you walk in freedom with him, as you give your life to Jesus and you begin to walk in freedom so that he can use you for a specific assignment in this world, that we all have that, every single one of us, as a follower of Jesus, that you have a calling on your life. But the oil process is an interesting process as well because the way you get olive oil is from olives and the olives have to go through a pressing. Imagine like French press coffee. Now, I don't, I'm going to just go off on a rant for a second. I don't know how many hipsters we have in here who like this whole pour over thing. I don't know what the deal with the pour over is because the French press is where it's at. Like it is the godly way to make coffee because it keeps all the oils inside of the coffee. It's really rich coffee because of the French press. It's not burned out. And the process is very similar for olives being turned into olive oil. And I learned this when I was in Israel that there was a place called the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus spent his very last night before he went to the cross. In fact, maybe you've seen it from the Passion of Christ, that scene in the movie where he's kneeling down and he's sobbing. And he, went, he underwent this process in the Garden of Gethsemane that's a medical condition called hematidrosis where he was so anxious and under so much stress that he sweated drops of blood. He was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to the cross. Is there any other way that I can do this? And he asked for the cup to be taken from him, right? Look familiar, my cup? He asked for the cup to be taken from him. And that garden is called Gethsemane. And when we're in Israel, we learned that the Greek of Gethsemane, right? The Greek Gethsemane means the place of pressing. And there's olive trees all over the garden of Gethsemane. It's a powerful symbol. But what we also learn that's even more powerful is that the Aramaic, which was the common language of the day, Aramaic, that place was called the Garden of Gadsemane. Gethsemane, Gadsemane. Gadsemane means in Aramaic the place of ascension. Oh, come on, can I go deep with you for just a second? This place, geographically, the location is where Jesus ascended up into heaven after he raised from the dead, spent some time here on earth, ascends up into heaven to go prepare a place for us. It's the same place that he's going to descend when he comes back to us. So two 
diametrically opposed concepts occurring in the same location, the place of pressing and the place of ascension. You know you can't have ascension without pressing. Come on, you know that you can't walk into the calling that God has for your life, this unique and distinct plan and assignment he has for you, without first undergoing some crushing. Because if you step into your calling preemptively without first going, into, going through a process of crushing, you're going to believe that you're the one who made the calling happen. You're going to begin to walk around with a swagger rather than a limp. And oftentimes God will allow us to walk through some difficult trial and crushing, crushing and pressing so that we walk around with a limp to realize that our brokenness is what's going to benefit others, not our talent. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now some of us could be tempted to go, well that seems really cruel of God that he'd walk us through some really difficult times, but I need you to understand that God's ways are higher than our ways. He has a purpose for this because we all have a cup. And before some of our cups can overflow, the first thing he has to do is empty our cup. Empty it of what, Davy? He's got to empty it of pride. He's got to empty it of sin. He's got to empty it of, of the contaminants that are, that are not allowing us to walk into the full calling that he has for our life. You know, God wants to serve up his food and drink on clean dishes. And so he's going to empty you first, but he promises that after he empties it, he's not just going to fill it. Hello. He says he's going to cause it to overflow. Because if he just filled it, it'd be for your benefit. And when it overflows, guess what? It overflows onto other people's cups for other people's benefit. Perhaps the brokenness you're walking into is not because of your benefit, but for other people's benefit. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about what we can do for others. This process has allowed me to walk a little differently. I was a terrible pastor before all this happened. Terrible. People would come in, they'd talk to me about their pain, and I'd go, I don't know. You probably did something wrong. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm just being, stra I'm being straight up. I didn't know because I had not walked through much measure of pain. And all of a sudden, when you walk through something yourself and you become an actual victim of something, I'm not talking about taking on a victim mentality because that's a difference. But you actually become a victim or pain enters into your life. Then you begin to move along the spectrum of just trying to sympathize with others to actually empathizing with others. And you're present with others. You know, the most powerful thing that you can do for someone in your life that's experienced pain is not to tell them some kind of theological pithy truth. Although it may be true, it's not helpful. The most important thing that you can do is just be present with them and empathize. How can I help? Cry with me. Be with me. It's a power to presence. And this right here and the process that I've been walking through has increased my capacity for pastoring. Perhaps God wants to increase your capacity for leadership, increase your capacity for parenting, increase your capacity and your calling for what he has designed you for. But first, in order to do that, he's got to make you decrease so that he can increase inside of you. The, the last thing, and I'm going to invite the band to come up, is um, he is mixing the ingredients. He's mixing the ingredients. You see the verse, and I'm going to skip over to verse 5 if we can, um, or the, the next verse in Psalm 23, if we can go to that one. Verse 6, it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now I saw this, and it was the, like literally a month or so after Amanda passed, and I'm like, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. There's no way. This doesn't look like goodness and mercy at all, God. This looks like pain and hardship and trial and depression and anxiety. This doesn't look anything like goodness and mercy. What do you mean by surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life? And he pointed me to a verse that I misunderstood for a long time, and that was Romans 8.28. They're going to put it up on the screen, Romans 8.28. It says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Do you know why I misunderstood this verse? Because I thought this verse said that all things are good for those who love God. That's why I thought walking into the valley of the shadow of death was punishment because I had done something wrong. Because it didn't make sense to me that, that if I'm following Jesus and something bad happens, man, where is the punishment? Come on. It's not punishment for something that we've done wrong. It's preparation for a greater potential in our future. Come on. And I said, how is this good? 
You said all things would be good when I follow you, that everything would be up and to the right, that everything, I don't know if you've ever heard TV preachers talk about that, that you're going to be prosperous and healthy and wealthy if you follow Jesus. Come on, that's the biggest crock there is. The powerful thing about following after Jesus is not that we are just going to experience happiness and up and to the right. It's that no matter what circumstances come at us, we have an anchor for our soul. We have a hope that is in heaven. We have someone that is stronger than all of our circumstances living in us. But I misunderstood it. I misunderstood it. It says we know that for all things, God God works all things, what? Together. Um, It's kind of like mixing ingredients. I don't know about you guys, but I like cake. Anybody here like cake? Hello. Um, There are some ingredients that I would not eat by itself. Like, I'm sorry, Rocky Balboa. Or... um, Gaston, when I was a lad, I ate four dozen eggs. You know, not there, bro. I'm not eating raw eggs by, my, by itself. Flour, come on. That sounds like a really cruel youth group game. You know, chubby bunny. <laughs> How much flour can you eat in 60 seconds? Baking soda, not doing it. Salt, nope. But there are some ingredients that I would take by itself. You know, hello. Some icing. Woohoo! Pillsbury Doughboy. Let's go. Like sugar? Oh my gosh. Pour some sugar on me. I don't know why you know that song. Come on. But here's the powerful thing when you put these ingredients in a bowl and you mix them together and then you put them under heat, something powerful happens. And the ingredients that would be bitter to your taste or that would dry you out, those ingredients become a catalyst for something when it's put into the oven. So this flour that by itself would dry you out actually becomes the thing that raises you up. Come on, some of you are in a dry season in your relationship with Jesus and God's saying, this is an ingredient in your life that's going to raise you up. Come on, the thing that would be really nasty salt to take by itself is the very ingredient that God's going to use to preserve your life and add flavor to your life so that you're more than just this run-of-the-mill Christian. You're more than just the mundane person who's just trying to go through the motions. You're somebody who actually has impact and flavor. He's mixing the ingredients. He's mixing the ingredients. Can I have a couple stage hands come up because I need you to help me finish this because this is I, I saw this. He's mixing the ingredients. While all things work together all things work together for those all things work what all things work what all things work what together he's mixing those ingredients let's go back to that last verse verse 6 surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life so he's mixing the ingredients all things work together to produce something that we can in the South, we say, that makes you smack your grandma. You know what I'm saying? Kenneth, would you stand right there? I want you guys to follow me. Can you follow me? I want you to follow me. Um, see, here's the trick. I need you to see this. This is, the, this is it right here. This is where, where we close. Um, the verse says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. But there's a key. The very beginning of that passage says, the Lord is my shepherd. So... If you want goodness and mercy to follow you, first the Lord, and we're going to act like Jesus, Jesus and Kenneth are twins here, you know. I know nobody is deceived by this. But if you want goodness and mercy to follow you, the Lord has to be your shepherd. Because if I'm my shepherd, if I'm my boss, I will get lost and goodness and mercy won't know where to follow me. But if I tuck myself behind Jesus in the valley of the shadow of death, and Jesus decides to go this way, I'm going this way, guess what has to, by command of God, follow me, goodness and mercy. So if Jesus decides to take a little route up here, then I follow him in the valley, and goodness and mercy follow me. And he decides to cut back and go around, then I follow him, and goodness and mercy have to follow me. And this is a promise. Now stop, Jesus. If Jesus decides to stop, I stop. If he runs, I run. Here's what I don't do. Hey, listen, don't sit down. Keep walking. 
Because if he brought you to it, he's going to see you through it. And we're asking God so many times to get our pain out of us. And God's like, no, I don't want to get you out of the valley of the shadow of death. I want to walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. And I saw this about a month after Amanda passed. I was like, I don't get it. Goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy. And then I read it another, a year later, I was preaching this message. And God spoke to my heart right when I was preaching it. And he said, hey, Dave, look back over this past year. Has goodness and mercy been following you? And all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, I don't know something's been following me until I look back. And then I see, over time, all the providential relationships that God's brought into my life. All the miraculous provision that he's brought into my life. All the healing that he has done, not I have done, not by my strength, not by my might, but by his might. All the restoration that's take place in my life because goodness and mercy is following me as I follow Jesus. I need you to hear something. I need you to hear something. A part of that restoration. I got to see happen this past December when I married a new bride, the beautiful Christy Monroy, now Blackburn, hello, who's sitting right up here. And this right here is our family. And I need you to see something, that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, in the midst of trial, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of pain, and in the midst of every single circumstance that can come your way, goodness and mercy will follow you.